Okay, welcome back to medical school. You are now second year medical students. It's official, and of course, we're going to be learning a lot more stuff this year in ultrasound. But I wanted to briefly first sort of go over the stuff you learned last year um, and just tie in some of the main concepts as just a basic review. And then um, if you watch this lecture before your scan session, uh, then you'll have the tools and the skills hopefully necessary to breeze through that scan session. We're doing things a little bit differently this year. We are going to have a podcast only lecture series by ultrasound so that um, whenever you learn ultrasound in person, uh, it's pure hands-on. No more lectures in person. This will all be through the podcast system. So um, hopefully this system will work out. Now remember that with the, uh, the Sonosite S machine, um, we have uh, the following. We've got the 2D button, and that's basically the brightness mode, and that kind of resets the whole uh, ultrasound machine back to the you know, white dots on a black background. On other products that Sonosite makes, um, there's the 2D button here. It's a slightly different location. This is on the, the machines we have in the ER, for example, the turbos. Um, but either way, 2D means um, just kind of reset the machine, brightness mode. Then there's M mode. M mode stands for motion mode. Uh, recall that this spike going through the tissue um, checks for motion at these different levels. These horizontal lines up here means there's no motion. This granular appearance down here means there's um, actual motion right there. This is actually the plural line at this location, which is why we see this granular appearance, and that means stuff's moving. Now, the other mode is Doppler, and there's different types of Doppler. First of all, there's color flow Doppler. Now, color flow Doppler is uh, simply um, red is flow towards the transducer, and blue is flow away from the transducer. And um, if you angle the probe one way or the other to try to anticipate which way the flow is going to be going, it should either be red or blue, and it should make uh, sense to you. Keep in mind that right at 90 degrees, uh, when the flow is at 90 degrees to the axis of the transducer, the um, cosine of theta is in the numerator of the Doppler equation. I know you hear me say that all the time over and over again. But it's worth repeating because you may be puzzled sometimes as to why you're not getting any flow, even though you're turning on the, uh, the Doppler. You may need to angle the transducer um, to get off at 90 degrees because cosine of 90 is 0, and that's not uh, going to give you any information since it's in the numerator. So color flow, and then there's um, power flow. Power flow is where after you've got the color on, you can toggle with the power uh, flow. And when the power flow is on, it looks like orange only type of flow. It's not directional. And uh, it's a lot less angle dependent and easier to work with than the color flow is. It's also more a sensitive type of, of flow that you would use, for example, uh, at low flow states like um, the lymph nodes or the testicles. And then finally, the um, different transducers have different frequencies about which they can toggle. And so you want to be able to have an idea of how to get the probe to go from 5 to 10, or 3.5 to 5, or 5 to 10, or 1 to 5. And uh, you know that the higher frequency means better resolution, but the sound can't uh, penetrate as far. And so, and that's, that's the idea. So with uh, higher frequency, um, you'd use that on a, on a, for example, with this transducer, you'd use that on a thin patient, whereas you'd go down to the 1 megahertz if the patient was really large. And, uh, you know, the same holds true for these different uh, transducers. Basically, um, you always want to take advantage of that and use the highest possible frequency to penetrate to the depth of interest. And the way we change the frequency is uh, on, on, the, on one machine, you, this is the um, button right here that changes it, corresponds to this button here, this menu soft key corresponds to this button. And then um, over here on the S machines, uh, it's this button over here that corresponds to uh, this menu item here. And you just basically push in either this button or this button, and then it's going to go from the, uh, the gen or general mode, and that's right in the middle frequency range of the transducer. When you push that button, it's going to toggle up to the res or resolution mode, and if you push it again, it's going to go down to the pen or a penetration mode. And uh, that's for the really large uh, obese patient. That's the lowest frequency uh, that each transi transducer can go to. Um, again, if I back it up, here we are at resolution mode. That's the highest possible frequency that uh, each transducer can go to. Um, and then general is right in the middle. So if it goes from like 1 to 5 megahertz, gen is 3 megahertz, res would be 5 megahertz, pen would be 1 megahertz. Now the basic scanning planes are pretty easy, but just to review them, 
or at least two of them here, the ones that confuse people. The sagittal plane is where you have the indicator aimed towards a patient's head, and sagittal means long axis when approaching anteriorly. And uh, so this would be the skin line here. This is anterior, and back here is posterior. Over here is superior towards the patient's head, and down here is inferior towards the patient's foot. Now, if I take that probe and move it from this anterior location and then put it on the side of the body, while the, still a longitudinal plane, we now have a, a coronal plane, though, because we're coming from the side of the body. So over here, this is lateral now, and this becomes medial. This is still superior. This is still inferior. Indicator towards the patient's head. Now, the various artifacts, just briefly, you need to know. The low attenuating uh, artifact, that's like fluid or the bladder. Remember, everything behind the bladder gets really hyperechoic, and you may need to compensate by turning down the far field gain. Here's the bladder here. Here's all this material back here that's hyperechoic. And what we would do is we could turn down that far field gain to compensate for the fact that the bladder is a low attenuating structure. But we can see how overgain the image is behind the bladder because it's low attenuating. Refraction is when you've got two different mediums of different densities and the sound gets redirected as it goes between one medium and the next, not unlike Snell's law by putting a pencil in a glass of water, which is why we see these shadows that come down on edges of an organ. So here's a shadow here, here's a shadow here, and sometimes this is referred to as lateral cystic shadowing because a cystic structure, because its density is less than the structure around it, it's going to exhibit refraction artifact along its edges. Another type of artifact is reverberation or reverb. That's where you have equidistant arcs that come down from the top of the probe. And it appears like uh, this. We see these equidistant arcs here coming down. And um, it's just a natural artifact that we see in all the transducers. And uh, you, know, you just have to remember that that can happen and that usually these artifacts cross the wall of the organ uh, into the space next to the organ. That's how you know it's an artifact. And then finally, the mirror image artifact as sound travels through the liver. Uh, this is the coronal view here in the liver with the kidney. As sound travels through the liver, it encounters the diaphragm, comes back to the transducer, and then a mirror image of the liver is placed above the diaphragm mistakenly by the machine up here in the chest. But the good news is that tells us that there is no blood or fluid up here in the chest. So it's normal to expect to see a mirror image artifact. When you lose the mirror image artifact, that's when you have a patient who's got fluid or blood in their chest. Over here, this is a normal mirror image of the liver above the diaphragm in the chest we expect to see on all patients except when they've got fluid there. When there's fluid here, now the sound can get across the diaphragm and everything up here appears black. Switching now to the kidney, um, we can do several approaches. We do an anterior approach, or in this case here we're doing a coronal approach, indicators towards the patient's head. Um, or we could do a posterior approach, you lay them on their side, or the term is decubit as to do a posterior approach, going in between the ribs. Notice that when you go in between the ribs, it does help to use a smaller footprint um, phased array transducer rather than that large footprint uh, curved or convexed array. The right kidney's got the liver around it, and it's usually pretty easy to see most of the right kidney because the liver is a relatively large structure. But this is what it looks like when we're coming either anterior or coronal. Over here, we're along the patient's back or posterior approach. Uh, we can see the entire uh, kidney here. Recall this is the kidney's uh, pelvis or sinus. Uh, and then out here, this is all the cortex of the kidney here. Now with the left kidney, since the spleen is not as big as the liver, we usually lose part of that lower pole of the, of the kidney. So um, we may need to jump down a rib level or, or uh, go a, a little more posterior in order to find that lower pole of that kidney. Switching to the bladder, we've got the indicator to the patient's right in the transverse view of the bladder and then towards the patient's head in a sagittal view of the bladder. And so in a transverse view, the indicator of the patient's right, we can see the bladder here as a structure that's way down low in the pelvis. Here's the female pelvis. The bladder appears quite, quite distended, quite large here. And when it's large like that, it pushes the uterus in a posterior location. And so this is a transverse view of the uterus. Um, but when the, uter when the bladder is not empty, as it is here, it's, I mean, when it's not full, when it's rather empty, here we can see this bladder is not very full at all. In fact, it's got very few cc's left in it. Now we can see that the uterus is actually on top of the bladder. So what happened was this is the vaginal stripe, and then the uterus went out behind the computer screen and then came back at you in a transverse view. This would be the fundus of the uterus up here. So when the bladder's full, again, it pushes the uterus quite um, you know, posteriorly, 
and then when the bladder is empty, now the uterus is very antiverted and comes and wraps around on top of the bladder. It looks a little funny the first time you see it with an empty bladder like that. Now, here's a male pelvis, a transverse uh, view of the male pelvis. This is a patient who's got a pretty generous prostate down here, and we can see this sort of uh, rectangular shaped bladder. Now, when we move into the sagittal plane, now we have the indicator towards the patient's head, we're going to sweep side to side through the bladder contents. So here's a transverse view of the male bladder, and then we're going to rotate the probe from that transverse view. Now it's in a sagittal view, and we're going to fan side to side through that bladder in a sagittal view. So first transverse, then sagittal. Now the female sagittal anatomy is a little bit more complicated, right, because there's some extra organs there. So what we're seeing here is a you know, relatively empty bladder and we see the vaginal vault here and this is that antiverted uterus coming back up towards this bladder. Now the less full that bladder is, the more antiversion that you're going to have. As this bladder fills, it's going to push the fundus of the uterus posteriorly or in that direction. Okay, and So just keep that in mind. This is the posterior cul-de-sac or pouch of Douglas back here. This is the anterior cul-de-sac over here, a vesico-uterine pouch. In both these locations, fluid can accumulate. So here we are in a transabdominal sagittal approach with the indicator towards the patient's head. Notice how triangular shape the bladder appears and we can see um, the uterus, the cervix, and this is the vaginal stripe. And so this being the outside world, vaginal stripe terminates at the cervix and the antiverted uterus comes up in this location here. And just to lay some labels on here so it's clear, there you go. Now, if an empty bladder is present, you can see how really antiverted, the, I mean, the uterus is like coming back like 180 degrees on itself onto the vaginal stripe, I should say. And so here's that empty bladder. But if that bladder was to fill, it would push the fundus of the uterus in that direction. Now, here's how you measure a bladder to determine its volume. Um, it's a very simple measurement. Um, a lot of the machines, you can enter the calipers in, and you can actually put the dimensions of the uh, three dimensions of the bladder, we're going to get first a, uh, an anterior posterior dimension or height of the bladder. The probe is in a transverse plane right now with the indicator to the patient's right. Then in the same transverse plane we're going to get the width of the bladder here. So we do the height and then the width. We either lock in or write down that second value, unfreeze the machine, and move it into a sagittal plane. Now what used to be the width is now the length when you've got it in a sagittal plane. Now that confuses a lot of people. Uh, just make sure you understand that. You can always back up this um, podcast in order to review that, but this is towards the head. This is now towards the feet in a sagittal plane. That third dimension um, in this machine calculates the bladder volume to be 437.8 cc's. Now if you didn't have that um, calculation built into the machine you were using, you could take the height, the width, the length, multiply those values by uh, themselves and then divide by two would give you an estimation of the bladder volume. And moving on to the heart, um, we have the uh, three main locations here for the transducer placement for the heart. We've got the peristernal lung with the indicator going towards the patient's left hip. We've got the apical four chamber the indicator going to the patient's right. And we've got the subxiphoid view with the indicator going towards the patient's right. And so remember that these Cardiac views are really defined by the structures that you see on the screen, not necessarily by those areas I just pointed out to you on that last diagram. So this is where there's a lot of art. Everybody has a different shaped chest wall, and you really need to work uh, to get these views in. A lot of this is pure pattern recognition. It requires probably the most amount of um, experience than any of the other things we're talking about to get all these views. And a lot of patients don't have all the views. you got to sort of be good at all the different windows because you may only find one or two uh, windows on a patient and those that have expanded lung fields or COPD, those that are intubated, often have very difficult peristernal or apical windows and that's why the subcostal or subxiphoid view becomes very important. And worst comes to worst, you can always lay the patient on their side. That brings the po point of maximal impulse to the chest wall. Uh, you can even sit them up. So peristernal lung, we've got the indicator down towards the patient's left elbow or left hip. Uh, as you can see here, if the arm is akimbo, it's going to be the, uh, the elbow. But if the arm, for some reason, is um, above their head, think about the left hip. Uh, that's the indicator uh, direction. And um, the structures that you see on that peristernal long axis, you get to see the, the left ventricle, the left atrium, 
and the right ventricular uh, outflow tract, and this is the uh, aortic outflow tract seen here. And here's the left atrium pumping into the left ventricle and out the aortic outflow tract. We can see the mitral valve here, the aortic valve, we see two leaflets of the three there, and then just above this left ventricle, recall that is where the right ventricle is. And here's what it looks like when it's normal. Uh, we can see the left atrium, left ventricle, aortic outflow tract, right ventricle. This is the interventricular septum. This is the posterior wall, and that mitral valve comes up and nicely smacks into that septum. The interventricular septum and posterior wall are making meaningful motion towards one another, and that's what we like to see. So from the long axis, you rotate the transducer 90 degrees, and then you'll get to the short axis. And depending where you are along that heart, if you're very you know, proximal, right up by that aortic valve, you may see this, the three cusps of the aortic valve, or what some people refer to as the um, Mercedes-Benz sign. And then if you angle the transducer a little bit more inferiorly, you get down to where that fish mouth view is, or the mitral valve. We can see it here, kind of bouncing around. Then we get down towards the apex. We see some of those papillary muscles down there towards the apex. So that's the idea. It's a 90 degree rotation from wherever you found the peristernal long. And we aim the indicator towards the patient's right. So if you found the peristernal long right at the left hip, the peristernal short will be at the patient's right hip. Proximally, aortic valve, as we fan the probe a little more distally or inferiorly, we see um, mitral and then papillary muscles. Here's just some examples here um, of the parasternal short axis. This is those papillary muscles I was talking about. And here's that uh, mitral valve or fish mouth view. And then more proximally, uh, we can see the aortic valve there. So it's all the same plane of the heart. It just depends where you cut it as to what structures that you'll see. You can see those papillary muscles, the mitral valve, and then uh, finally the uh, aortic valve in that view there. This being the uh, left ventricle, and this little piece over here being the right ventricle in that parasternal uh, short axis. Here we go again, the parasternal short axis. We see the left ventricle here, and we see the right ventricle adjacent to it here sometimes. These are papillary muscles seen down here. So we're down towards the apex in that view. This one here, we're a lot more proximal because I see the, the Mercedes-Benz sign of the aortic valve right in the center of the screen. Once again, this is a very thickened um, left ventricular wall, but we can see the um, mitral valve fish mouth view bouncing up and down. Now the apical four chamber involves placing the transducer right at the point of maximal impulse, aiming the sound towards the base of the heart. And this allows assessment um, of the various chamber sizes, and the, really the best way to do this is to get the PMI to come to the chest wall, so roll the patient left lateral decubitus. We can see as an example of what we're trying to convey here, We've got the probe down on this side of the, the chest looking up towards the great vessels. And as we do so, we can uh, make out the various chambers. This is an upside down view trying to demonstrate where the skin line is, where the probe is placed against the skin line, but it's really looking up into the heart in this projection here. This being the left side of the heart, the left ventricle, left atrium, right ventricle, right atrium. Although just remember this is an upside down sort of uh, view just to make this demonstration hopefully more clear. And this is the actual sector. We can see it from the top of the screen, LV, RV, LA, RA. You can see how these labels come along now. The left ventricle, the left atrium, the right ventricle, and finally the right atrium. Mitral valve is on this side tricuspid valve on that side. Just another normal apical four-chamber view. Here's the LV, RV, LA, RA. Septum is up here. Mitral valve, tricuspid valve. So 
We talked about getting to the apical fifth chamber, uh, put air quotes around the word fifth chamber because obviously the heart doesn't have fifth chamber, but the fifth chamber being the aortic outflow tract. So if you angle up uh, or tilt the transducer um, so that the sound is going more anterior, um, the uh, right atrium and the tricuspid valve kind of go out of the view of the plane and you start to get this uh, aortic outflow tract. Um, sometimes you got to go one intercostal space more superior, more towards the head, and a little bit more lateral to get a better alignment of the ultrasound with the LV outflow tract. So this is what happens. We can see the right side of the heart kind of went away, and here's that left ventricle, left atrium. This is that fifth chamber, the uh, aortic uh, outflow tract. And it's that aortic outflow tract here that we're going to really start thinking about where to place our Doppler. But before we get to where we place the, the pulse wave Doppler, we're going to talk about the um, location to, to first measure the LVOT diameter. So go into the parasternal long axis. Okay, this is parasternal long, remember LA, uh, LV, aortic outflow tract. And, um, and you want to go right when that aortic valve is open, right during systole. We can see the aortic valve maximally sort of excursion here, and that's the, the distance between the um, origins of the leaflets where we're going to measure the left ventricular outflow tract diameter. Now you could take that value squared, times it by pi, divide it by 4, and that will give you the LVO2 area. Luckily our ultrasound machines do that um, simple calculation for us. And then um, we're going to take the velocity time integral um, of the LVOT. So here's what happens. It's the amount of blood that's going through that left ventricular outflow tract um, that is given by the velocity time integral. And so what we do is um, we line up in the apical fifth chamber. We put that pulse wave Doppler sampling gate right over the valve, the aortic valve, and um, right at the LV outflow. And combined with that other measurement that we had, the LVOT um, diameter, we, we then um, activate the tracing, uh, the waveform of the pulse wave Doppler. And it's this envelope, um, this volume, that uh, flow that is the, that's the machine is going to take the integral of and to give you the LVOT, um, or to give you the um, LVOT velocity time integral, I should say. So here's that LVOT diameter squared times pi divided by 4, that term we already knew. Now, this is what the machine is going to calculate for us over here. These two things combine together to give a stroke volume, and it looks at the heart rate on the screen and multiplies that by the stroke volume, and then we'll pop out the cardiac output in uh, liters per minute. And that's uh, kind of what we've been doing here um, with our cardiac um, output calculations, and we can see that going on right here. So here's the um, pulse wave Doppler along that apical fifth chamber, and we can see the cardiac output being calculated by the machine. This is a, but that's the idea. not a pretty waveform at all. It's just one I happen to have my residents were doing. Um, I happen to catch on video, but it's, it's the concept, though, that um, we're putting all this together. The machine is actually going to be grabbing that um, the velocity time integral for us, and combined with the LVOT diameter, um, we'll calculate the cardiac output. Now, moving on to the other view of the heart, the sub-xiphoid view. The probe will be placed um, flat just underneath the xiphoid process, and looking up uh, towards the chin, we'll be able to use the liver as our window to get a good four-chambered assessment of the heart. Now, um, sometimes it's difficult to do this view, as you've all kind of realized last year, depending on your patient's uh, chest wall shape and abdominal uh, cavity shape. So what you need to do with the indicator aimed at the patient's right Sometimes it's helpful to start right up underneath, this, underneath the liver. Make sure you get a good view of the liver on the screen, and then slide that transducer right up into the subxiphoid notch. And then, more often than not, you'll see the heart on the other side of the liver. That's the idea. And as you do so, um, it's difficult to do this when the patient's got a small liver because you don't get um, a very good window then of this heart. And so if you have a patient who's got cirrhosis of the liver, this can be quite a challenging um, a view to get. And so just keep that in mind. But when you do get a good subxiphoid view, here's the liver at the top of the screen, RV, RA, LV, LA. Both valves are seen, the tricuspid and the mitral. 
on this view. That's why it's a very popular view. One way to try to, to keep in mind to how to remember the, the protocol uh, to get all these views is you could think about doing a clockwise approach. So you can plop the probe down on the chest wall, okay, and first aim the indicator towards the patient's left, and that'll give you the parasternal long axis. And then simply rotate the probe 90 degrees to the patient's right, and that'll give you the parasternal short axis. And then with the indicator still aimed to the patient's right, you could slide down to the apical four chamber view and fifth chamber view, and then with the indicator still to the patient's right, you can slide it around clockwise to the subcostal view. And so parasternal long, parasternal short, apical four chamber, apical fifth chamber, subcostal view. There are other views of the heart that we have not discussed uh, yet uh, that we may get into um, as the um, year progresses. Moving now to the gallbladder. Uh, basically, um, gallbladder scanning 101 involves taking a transducer, either a curved array or a phased array transducer. In this case, we're using a large footprint curved array. We have the indicator aimed to the patient's uh, head, have the patient take a deep breath, and then you're going to slide along that subcostal uh, margin uh, laterally. And uh, what you should see is this. Here's the fundus of the gallbladder, the body, and down here is the neck of the gallbladder. Up to 10 centimeters in length and 3 centimeters in width is normal. And sometimes it's difficult because there's lots of black objects on the screen. You're not sure which one's the gallbladder. Keep in mind that the main interlobar fissure, or MILF, is visualized to connect the portal vein to the neck of the gallbladder. And we could see one example here of that interlobar fissure. Uh, we could see another great example here of this main interlobar fissure. Again, portal vein, neck of the gallbladder here. And it's just basically one of the landmarks to think about. This is another really nice example of the MILF right over here. We see portal vein, neck of the gallbladder. And again, that's our landmark. It's where the right and left lobes of the liver come together. That's the fossa that the gallbladder sits in. So it really does help um, to roll the patient on the left side. Here we are trying to get the view, and we're having a tough time. And so as we roll the patient uh, off to their left, now we get some of those loops of bowel to fall out of the way, and um, the gallbladder can be much easier to see. That's a big trick that I use whenever a resident is struggling with the gallbladder. They can't seem to find it. Um, the patient uh, rolls off over to their side, and uh, suddenly these pesky loops of bowel kind of fall out of the way, and we can see the gallbladder easier. Once you insulate the gallbladder in the long axis, you also need to uh, view it in the short axis. Uh, when you, once you do get the gallbladder in the long axis, you're going to fan through the gallbladder, like so, making sure you catch the entire gallbladder, looking for any type of pathology. After you're done with the long axis, you're going to rotate the probe 90 degrees from whatever axis you're in, like so, and you're going to view the gallbladder in the short axis. Again, you're going to fan through the entirety of the gallbladder looking for any possible pathology. And um, so it's really two views, and that's the idea in all of ultrasound, is to view things in two separate planes and then recreate that three-dimensional anatomy in your brain. That's the trick to all of ultrasound. Here we are on the transverse plane, and we've got a lot of circles on the screen once again. This is the most anterior or circle that's closest to the skin line is the gallbladder. Here's the kidney, inferior vena cava, aorta is seen. In young thing patients, we tend to find the gallbladder more lateral and anterior. In those patients, if you can't find it with the subcostal sweep or the X-7 approach, it's often helpful to take the indicator and really flatten it out against the abdomen. The indicator is pointed towards the patient's right. Uh, the probe itself is flattened out as much as you can. You kind of uh, fan through the gallbladder anterior to posterior as you work your way laterally. And oftentimes you'll find the gallbladder up in this area here. In this X minus 7 approach, is helpful in the larger patients. Basically, larger patients, the gallbladder tends to be more rounded, found a little bit higher, and more lateral. So it helps to take the transducer from the X or xiphoid process and then slide it to the X minus 7 location, look between the ribs. But the gallbladder will test your um, ability to find it many times. It's really the art of sonology. 
you, know, you can find in all these different locations here. Sometimes you're in a coronal plane, sometimes you're transverse, sometimes you're sagittal. It's just you're you know having the patient take a deep breath. You're rolling them on their side. You're looking between the ribs. It's just this. Um, it can be difficult. And there's other pitfalls that we're going to go through the rest of the year when it comes to gallbladder pathology um, that can trip you up also. So just keep that in mind. The gallbladder is a is a worthy opponent, and once you uh, master it. Um, you really are taking your skills to the next level. Moving to the leg veins, um, the lower extremity, here we can see the um, common femoral uh, vein as it comes uh, out of, it becomes from the iliac, it comes down here to the common femoral vein, and, and then it comes down the leg, and eventually goes through this adductor canal, and then becomes the popliteal vein. This adductor canal is very difficult to visualize the common femoral vein in, but usually about a third or half way down the leg, you can get most of the uh, visualization pretty easily. And um, so that's what we're going to be doing when we're looking for a DVT in the lower extremities is compressing this area here in a transverse plane, and then we move to the popliteal fossa. And we can see here, this is a very proximal location, superficial and deep femoral arteries. Here's the common femoral vein. Notice that it's medial to the arterial structures. Venus is closer to the penis. Venus, penis, it rhymes. It's easy to remember. Sometimes you get all twisted around. You're not sure where you are. So um, in this case, this would be the left leg. And su superiorly, we have this medial lateral configuration, but as we march distally, um, these structures become anterior posterior pretty quickly. And that's the location of the femoral vein. Now in the popliteal fossa, what happens is the vein uh, is more superficial to the artery, or the vein comes to the top and the pop. Here we are uh, behind the knee. And uh, as we come down, we can see there's a little bifurcation many times, sometimes even a trifurcation. And what we're going to be doing is compressing um, the vessels back here behind the knee. I usually take my hand and put it on the patient's knee and take my other hand on the probe and push my two hands together. And this is what it looks like when there's no blood clot in the venous system. Here's the saphenous vein, common femoral vein, common femoral artery without compression. This is with compression. The venous structure is easily compressed away. And it's at that location, way superiorly, where the saphenous uh, is confluent with the common femoral vein that you want to start this process and then march distally. So when you have good full compression here, uh, there's no clot. And you know you're pushing too hard when you start to see the arteries compress. And when you do have a clot, it looks like this. Here is echogenic uh, material seen here in the um, lumen of the common femoral vein. And as we compress, it does not, um, the walls do not coapt or come together. And once you determine that somebody does have a blood clot, you don't want to compress anymore. You know, capture that on video and uh, show somebody without having to keep compressing it because the more you compress these clots, the more likelihood of dislodging a DVT and becoming a pulmonary embolism, which is not a good thing, obviously. Here we are in the popliteal uh, fossa now. Remember the vein comes to the top and the pop. We see it nicely compressible. This is the artery down here. It stays open. I'm trying to track this artery here. There's a lot of movement, uh, but that's the idea. The vein's compressed, the artery stays open. But when we have a clot back there, here's the artery right here. This is the clot here. It's actually a pretty dilated uh, vein here with this clot in it. That's common. This one happens to be pretty echogenic thrombus as well. But that's the artery down here. Here's the vein. That's a positive DVT. Moving on to the aorta, we know that the uh, aorta follows the natural curvature of the spine. As you go from proximal to distal, the aorta becomes more superficial. Um, as the spine is more lordotic, um, and as the vertebral bodies increase in size, it pushes the distal part of the aorta closer to the skin line. Recall also that the aorta is on the left side of the spine. So here's the aorta, here's the spine, just left to it. The first branch that comes off is the celiac axis. It brings blood to the large organs in the abdomen like the spleen and the liver. The next branch is the superior mesenteric artery, which brings blood to a very large organ, the uh, intestines. Here we are in a sagittal plane. We can see that the first branch of the abdominal aorta is the celiac axis, um, and it appears like that in a sagittal plane. We have the indicator towards the patient's head, and then when we have the indicator to the patient's right in a transverse plane, it looks like this. Um, we can see that this is the celiac axis coming over here, and it appears that the splenic artery is coming over this way, and the common hepatic is kind of going over this way. Sort of hard to see when it's moving around like that, uh, but when you put power flow on it, we can make it out. Here's the aorta, celiac axis, splenic artery, common hepatic artery going this way. We call sometimes the seagull sign, like the arms of the seagull, the wings of the seagull coming out. <laughs> arms of the seagull. 
sagittal view here of the superior mesenteric artery. Uh, it's the second branch off the abdominal aorta. Pretty easy to see there in its sagittal plane. This is also sagittal. Here's the aorta. Here's that celiac axis. Below it is the superior mesenteric artery. Um, pretty easy to see with a powerful Doppler. And, but you always, again, want to look at things in two planes. We're going to go, go now to this transverse plane. I'll go through this a couple of times. Spine shadow. This is the aorta. Now we see it in short axis, just left of the spine shadow. Here's the IVC. Splenic vein. I'm sorry. Left renal vein. This is left renal vein here, getting nut cracked between the SMA and the aorta. The left renal vein is trying to drain into the IVC. Splenic vein is what's crawling over the SMA. And we see some pancreas tissue out here towards the tail of the pancreas. Maybe the head of the pancreas is like right over here. And this is all the liver up here. Another review of the transverse anatomy. Indicators to the patient's right. And we see the spine shadow, aorta, IVC, SMA. Here's that worm of splenic vein crawling over SMA. This is the pancreas with its body and tail down here, liver. One more time. What's that? Spine shadow. What's this? Aorta. What's this? IVC. What's this? SMA. Looks like a mantle clock. What gets nut cracked between the aorta and the SMA? Draining into IVC. Left renal vein. What vessel crawls over the SMA? Splenic vein. This is all the pancreas and then the liver. The technique is to start high up in the epigastrium, compress many times using both your hands, push a lot of pressure, and you're going to see that spine shadow pop on the screen, and you just drag the probe down towards the bifurcation to the patient's feet. Now here we are in a sagittal plane, and we are actually looking at not the aorta, but the IVC. The IVC is traipsing along underneath the liver. This is the portal vein here, and so the structure that runs perpendicular but posterior to the IVC is what? Well, it's the right renal artery. See, the right renal artery is trying to get blood from the aorta, which lies on the left side of the body, over to the right kidney, which is on the right side of the body. And to do so, it needs to go behind but cross perpendicular to the IVC. That's why we see it kind of pooching into the IVC. And... Uh, once again, in the transverse plane, we see the IVC here, aorta, left renal vein, SMA, splenic vein, pancreas, liver. Now, the IVC is important because it's a non-invasive it's a non-invasive way to estimate the pressure in the uh, right atrium. And this becomes important when you're trying to determine a patient's volume status or fluid status. In the setting of hypotension, there's a very strong urge by everyone to push more fluids, but sometimes that's not the cause of the hypotension. So you wouldn't, sometimes it's very contraindicated to push more fluids. And this is a way to determine that. Basically, um, that the smaller the IVC, the more collapsible it is, the lower the pressure in the right atrium of the heart is. The more plethoric or large the IVC is, and the less collapsibility, the higher the pressure. So here's an IVC right here that doesn't really change much with respiration and it's about a two centimeter IVC. So I'd say this patient has probably about a 15 centimeter to 20 centimeter um, central venous pressure. Here's one that's very small and with inspiration it collapses all the way down. So this patient has a very low central venous pressure, probably uh, certainly in the single digits, um, probably less than five. Again, here's one that's plethoric, it's very large, doesn't change with respiration. In this case, though, I want to point out the hepatic vein. Hepatic vein drains into IVC. The location in which to really focus on the IVC's diameter change is about two centimeters distally to where the hepatic vein drains in. Now, switching gears to talk about the carotid. The, um, recall that the intimal medial thickness of the carotid artery is a predictor of cardiovascular disease. And we're going to measure along the far wall of the carotid artery. This is the bifurcation of the carotid artery here. The internal, larger, of the two goes in this direction. And then the external goes in this direction, smaller of the two. Remember, the indicator is towards the patient's head. 
We use the linear transducer. You can tell by its footprint. It's a nice flat footprint, high frequency. And we're going to measure this little thickness back here. Anything greater than a millimeter is abnormal. So here we are with the linear transducer indicator to the patient's head. And we can see in various views here, this is the carotid artery traipsing along, and we're measuring the far wall. And um, this is all proximal to the bifurcation. Here's the far wall of the carotid artery, the intimal medial thickness right here. Down here we see it again, the intimal medial thickness, the far wall of the carotid artery. Pretty easy to do, but you've got to blow it up to drop your calipers just right. Here we, here we really enlarge this view. And you try to estimate it along a length of about a centimeter. Moving to the thyroid, we can see here, this is the isthmus of the thyroid. We've got the probe in a transverse plane. We can see from this schematic diagram here that the thyroid normally has a right lobe, an isthmus, and a left lobe. Notice that the thyroid is medial to the carotid arteries, but it's just posterior to the muscles in the neck. We can see those muscles up here. The thyroid should have a very nice isoechoic texture to it, somewhat hyperechoic and isoechoic. It looks, for all intents and purposes, almost exactly like the testicle tissue. Same sort of glandular looking appearance here. This is a sagittal view of the thyroid. We can see some of the vasculature poking through it, and we can see its nice isoechoic texture. When you scan the eye, you want to use copious amounts of gel. Have the patient close their eyelid and use a lot of gel so you don't really even make contact with the eyelid. The probe is sort of sitting up here just above this ultrasound gel. And we can see the eyelid here is closed. And the various parts of the eye are outlined here. There's the anterior chamber. That's the lens. The iris you can appreciate here. In fact, where this iris comes together, the area here in the middle here, is the pupil. So it's not surprising that this pupil is quite dilated right now because the eyelid is closed. But if you shined light in the other eye that you weren't doing the ultrasound in, that was open, you would see contraction of this pupil. Now, the area back here is all the posterior segment or the vitreous humor. And the retina lies right back along here, right along the choroid of the eye. This is the choroid of the eye back here. And this is the optic nerve sheath coming down from the back of the eye. 